Congratulations. You made it. We really were wondering how many people are going to brave the elements and this awful weather to come to listen to Nadine Sierra. And I'm very happy and grateful for your presence here tonight. I'm absolutely sure that you are not going to regret it even when you walk out. It's going to be even worse than when you came in. <laughs> because your heart is going to be so warm uh, out of this experience that you will forget the snow. Uh, also because I have to remind you that the previous time we were forced to cancel uh, Miss Sierra's previous engagement here because of snow. At that time NYU closed and when they decided there is nothing we can do about it. So snow or rain or shine, Miss Sierra is here with us tonight and we are extremely grateful to her as well. Hold your applause because you're going to do it in just a minute. I'm just introducing very briefly uh, Fred Plotkin that you all know by now perfectly well. I'm just inviting you to read his last article on WQXR. Uh, and it's an article that analyzes in depth the next season of the Metropolitan Opera House. Um, I believe like five minutes after the official announcement was made, Fred's article was already online. <laughs> I, I have a hunch that he has some sort of inside information but anyway, it's a brilliant, brilliant piece. Um, the, the, the thing that he always does, uh, somehow at my request, is that he mentions how many of these operas are in Italian. And Fred, they're out of 20, 14 out of 25 are in Italian. So we're still holding that flag high up in the world of opera. So for me right now, that's all that matters. But of course, Fred goes in depth into the the repertoire, the new productions, the singers that are present, those who are not present. So do read it if you just want to have a, a serious introduction to what to expect from uh, the Metropolitan Opera next year. One more, one more little thing is uh, I, I just want to mention is that Fred has recently been appointed a trustee of the Oxford Cultural Collective, and he has already started working on projects as well, too but they're not going to steal him from us. Do not worry. <laughs> and now, without further ado, please welcome Fred Plotkin and Nadine Sierra. Can you imagine coming through the snow in this outfit? <laughs> that is an artist. <laughs> I changed. It's, it's an illusion. As Stefano mentioned, uh, Nadine was supposed to come here a couple of years ago, but NYU closed. There was a blizzard that night, and everything was closed. Tonight there is snow, but it's not a blizzard. <laughs> But nonetheless, I do appreciate your coming. You're a Florida girl, so that I am. this <laughs> must be <laughs> a bit alien environment for you. Yes. But um, <coughs> I'm very pleased Nadine is here for many reasons. One is, we figured out I've known her for about a third of her life. I met her, can I say your age? Of course. She's yes. 30. And I met her when she was 19. And um, <laughs> what marks her out among many things, is that she's really one of very few singers in history. Uh, I think Roberta Peters, Teresa Stratus, Danielle Denise, Nadine is about it, who really seemed to have everything going before they turned 20, and were already making appearances in major theaters and, and recognized for their gifts. But in your case, it's not just your vocal gifts, but you have, in the 11 years I've known you, continued to grow as an artist. And not every performer grows. They often rest on what they did when they were 19 and live on that for as long as they can. But the 
exponential growth in Nadine's artistry in the 10 years since, 11 years, uh, has been extraordinary. And so at the age of 30, she's still at an age when many singers have barely begun, and you already have massive accomplishments singing in the major theaters of the world. So she can speak from experience, even at this tender age, and we're going to talk about some of the music she's done, but also how she sings, which I think is very, very important. So please do welcome Nadine Sierra. That was the role of Ilya from Mozart's Idomeneo, <clears throat> which, by the way, was his biggest hit in his lifetime. He made more money on that opera than any other. And um, it, in the original production of this, which is older than you are by a number of years, and I worked <laughs> on that, we had 
Luciano Pavarotti yep. as the Domineo, Federica von Stada as the Damante, the son, um, Ileana Coltrubash in your role, Ilia, and Renata Scotto as the woman in the big dress that was played by Elsa van den Haver here. And the conductor then, back in the early 80s and recently, was James Levine, and therefore he was the only person who remained a musical link. Mm. And he conducted these Mozart operas, these opera seria, which is to say La Clemenza di Tito and Adomineo, with great passion. What did you learn about Mozart singing from him, and especially this role in this opera? Everything. <laughs> You know, be, I remember my first musical rehearsal with him. It was actually my first time even working with Levine. Um, I had met him before, but only in passing. And I, I will admit I was very nervous because I felt like <sighs> I didn't give myself a lot of credit back then with all of the experience or training that I, I had had at that time. And I almost felt like, I would let him down because I was either too young or too green or too fresh in his eyes because, yeah, we had such a massive age and experience difference. Um, what he taught me was how to feel worthy enough to sing this kind of music no matter what age I was or what experience I lacked. And honestly, he was the first conductor to ever make me feel that way. Um, and I had worked with a lot of wonderful conductors before him. So I felt, I felt, I guess, more at ease singing this kind of music. Because again, Ilya was also a role I, I had never tackled in my life. And I just thought, all of the history and all of the um, kind of the amazing qualities that came with this production, the opera, I'm, I'm pretty sure Levine was the one who brought Idomeneo to the Met. Yes. Yeah. So it had never you know, been performed before at the Met when he first had it premiere there. And I, I felt really overwhelmed, but then I just, I felt like I just had to enjoy it. And he gave me that. He, it was like a little gift from him that I, yeah, I guess I'll never forget. And since then, I've kind of psyched myself out of that feeling of not feeling, yeah, I guess worthy enough or experienced enough to sing certain types of music. It doesn't matter. When you're an artist, when you're um, especially an artist who has trained so much and has tried to educate oneself so much over the years, you're worthy to sing anything as long as you um, give it as much heart, energy, and joy as, um, as you would anything else. And that's exactly what Levine did for everything that he ever mm -hmm. conducted and presented at the Met and I think everywhere else he yeah. went in his life. I agree. Um, Julian, set up number two, please. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about a technical thing regarding yourself, but also Levine. Every singer I've ever spoken to who's worked with him talks about his knowledge of breathing ah, yeah. for the singer <laughs> and the way he will shape a phrase in the orchestra if he finds that the singer is a bit behind in distress, where if you're singing a duet and one of you has tons of voice, the other less so. How does that happen? And it doesn't have to be Levine, but he is the master of that the dialogue, this unspoken dialogue between the stage and the pit. That's very good. I had always heard before I worked with him, and it, of course it ended up being true, that he, he was a singer's conductor. Um, he just innately knew how, maybe he learned it over the years with all of the amazing singers that he worked with, but he just knew how to help singers and help them kind of cover up their weaknesses whilst <laughs> showcasing their strengths. And he did see that breath control was one of the things mm -hmm. that I had to my, my ability. Um, and he, <laughs> he encouraged me to use it, but he encouraged me to use it wisely with 
the music and of course with the, the text. Um, but any chance that I could get to either not breathe, that was always usually the case, uh, because I, I told him I felt like the phrasing was more legato, it was more expressive for me and I could do certain things with that if I didn't take that breath. He just gave me that freedom to do it and therefore I always felt comfortable. Um, and that was nice. And it was funny because when he would let me do that, and we had these like little exchanges from stage to the pit, he would always look up, he has these glasses, he would look up and he would smile at me. And it just gave me the encouragement or the energy that I needed to do whatever it was I had to, um, yeah, while I was performing. And that, that was always a very nice uh, feeling to have. Okay, so I didn't hear what you said, but I know you were correct. <laughs> <laughs> Because Stefano, I had to talk something technical. Oh, so, okay, okay, no um, worries. <laughs> I, I think that eventually we're going to have the next video uh, video selection. But in the meantime, I'll talk about how I met you. Um, sure. In October of 2009, um, Marilyn Horn was, as you know, apart from being one of the greatest singers in history, is also a wonderful teacher. And she was asked by a cruise line that had a ship with 90, that could hold 93 passengers to bring four young artists and two pianists and one person who can talk, um, <laughs> basically to teach the other 86 people on the ship how, everything about opera. So it was working with young artists it was uh, master classes, it was their solo recitals, it was going off the ship in the Adriatic and Greece and Turkey and them singing in temples and churches. It was super cool. It was sort of an amazing <laughs> trip. Yeah. And the four artists were Nadine as a soprano, you were 19 or 20, I think. Yeah. Um, Sasha Cook, wonderful mezzo-soprano, Joshua Stewart, the tenor, and Andrew Garland, the baritone. I don't know if you know these other singers, but they're all really wonderful. And I find it so interesting that Marilyn could spot them so young and say these four are gonna be great singers in the future, and they are. Um, so we traveled down, I think we began in Venice and ended yes. in Athens, mm -hmm. and we traveled all over in this little ship. And Marilyn, unfortunately, had had a sciatic or some back issue so she was sidelined for most of the trip and came out occasionally, but basically it gave me the opportunity to work with the four singers and the two pianists. And what did you learn on that trip about, about dealing with unexpected circumstances? <laughs> Let's put it that way. To suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> to suck it up and eat. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was good food on this cruise. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, no, we enjoyed ourselves mm -hmm. a lot. And quite honestly, um, I mean, I think singing for all of us, just performing in general, was always such a joy and a pleasure. So to be able to do that whilst traveling all over the Mediterranean, learning about opera, sharing our, um, our passions about opera with other people, at least those guests that were there, and to have her there yeah. supporting us and rooting us on like she always does. I had the time of my life. Yeah. Well, reminder, it was a ship that holds 93 people. That was very small. Yes. And we all were sort of on top <laughs> of one another all the time. And the breakfast, which were very good, was served. They would cook it and hand it to you right there. There was no kitchen. There was no waiter. They would cook it, and here's your breakfast. And um, the singers were always out in public, except when you hid in your stateroom. You probably shared a room with Sasha, I'm guessing? I shared my room with Carol Wong. Carol Wong, with the my pianist. pianist. Okay. And um, so it's very interesting because there's no privacy at all. I would hide in my stateroom periodically just to review <laughs> my notes because I, I was filling in a lot and I had to suddenly know her repertory which perhaps an hour before I didn't have to know. So um, 
it's a very interesting environment, but opera lovers really love opera, and we had 86 of them on the ship. <laughs> 85, because Marilyn was one of the artists, too. Um, and they love to talk. They love to give opinions. They love to think they're always right about things. And, and we can't always be in the position to say, no, no, no Mozart didn't write that, um, <laughs> things like that. But um, nonetheless, I saw it as a learning experience for all of you, because dealing with the public at such a young age, number one, singing when the ship is doing yeah. this. It did that a lot. It did that too. a lot on a little, it was a little boat. Yeah. It was not a you know big cruise ship. And I remember, you know, I got to stand, I couldn't lean on a music stand. <laughs> I had to lean on something that would stay still. And often mm. I would be stepping off the stage to turn and look at them. And I saw my hand going like this, not because I intended to do that, the ship was doing that. <coughs> But what I found so interesting that the four of you plus the two pianists, Jerome Tan was the other pianist. Yes, that's right. Um, were so adaptable. And I felt that one of the big takeaway lessons for all of you from that is in opera, which is it happens in real time live in front of lots of people, you have to pay attention and you have to adapt and you have to do whatever is happening at that moment. And, it's and, totally true. Yeah, yeah. And you know, we were also part of Marilyn Horn's foundation when her foundation still existed. Um, she is not only such a wonderful, humble person, but she's also very good at putting people together. Mm -hmm. And she put all of us, I think she just somehow knew we would all get along or that we were all friends from before. And so, I, I don't know, it just didn't seem like work. It just seemed like we were all having fun, singing, doing what we love, and doing it together, yeah. um, which made the biggest difference in the world. And I think that's why we could, you know, give such a you know, nice performance or a nice master class or whatever we did for the audience. Um, she was very, she's very, very good at that, and, and I'm happy that I got to share that with that particular group. And I can tell you, because I've been around the opera block a thousand times, is that when I first saw Nadine work, I've seen many, many, many wonderful young artists, but immediately I knew she was, you and Sasha, basically, were two artists who so were off on a whole other higher level of artistry and with gifts. And Sasha Cook, who I'd love, she doesn't sing in New York much, but I'd love to have her come here one night, um, went in a very distinct direction for her. And you have gone in a very distinct direction for you. Um, this is not your doing, but you have a very singular voice. Oh. Thank your parents and DNA yes. for that. <laughs> but it is a very unmistakable voice. And many times we have artists, especially young artists, who sound somewhat similar. They sound great, but they sound similar. But if you were to put a blindfold on me and play Nadine's voice, I could know it in two seconds Aww, because it is, it's notable. It's beautiful, but it's also very distinct. It has many colors. There's one other singer of your generation like that Leah Crocetto. Oh yeah. Whose voice is just so full Amazing. of colors and styles and so on. And but you and she are the only two who really stand out that way. So um given that you could go in so many directions artistically and we're gonna explore some of that tonight. But I first want to check Julian, are we ready with number two? Uh yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Nadine, when she was a little girl, watched an opera video, uh, live on TV actually, I think it was live. No, you were not born yet, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> because that was the first production I worked on at the Met, and I remember it very well, yeah. but apparently this was the video that changed your life, so we're gonna watch a little of it.
Julian, please set up number three. Um, so what grabbed you with that when you saw it? Well, Teresa Stratus was really in a league of her own as an opera singer, because as you can see, she was also an incredible actress um, and a very devoted actress at that. Every single little thing she did had a meaning. There was always something behind it, always a kind of the the, the context of everything was there in her eyes. And I even read when she did this, she worked very closely with Zeffirelli, all of them did, and she demanded that she did her own makeup for this particular role because I think maybe it was more traditional that they made Mimi a little bit healthier yeah. looking yeah. and she wanted her I mean you see her she looks like a corpse and she wanted to look like that she wanted to look ill she wanted to show that this woman it's not about Rodolfo falling in love with her because she's particularly beautiful or glamorous or completely different from Musetta but because the inside of her is so precious and so different from from anything he's probably ever or anyone he's probably ever met and she's like a poem she's like a walking poem and he's a poet and she even as you see when she looks at him she says you, she says poetry to him like do you understand what i'm talking about he says of course i do <laughs> and he already told her before that he's a poet that's what he does um I just couldn't, I don't know, it's so, it, this, if you've never seen this, please, please try to, because it's so beautifully done by everybody, not just her, but it's so believable. And I, I had worked, I was 10 years old when I saw this. Mm. It was a VHS that my mother had rented from the library and we never returned it. We still have it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, <laughs> And there was, a, there was some point when I broke it because I watched it so much and she actually sent it to a guy who specialized in, um, yeah, <laughs> in, um, I guess, remanufacturing VHS tapes and he fixed it for me. So it's still there. It's like this treasure that's at my parents' house. And um, I, I had studied musical theater. I had studied some pop music a little bit, but this was the moment when I thought, this is what I want to do with music. This is, I want to make people feel the way she's making me feel um, with music. And I, I didn't realize there was music out there that could tell a story so profoundly and so deeply to change your life. I didn't know that that existed. And I thank my mother really every day when I'm able to do what I do because if it hadn't been for that moment and it had, if it hadn't been for that, I, yeah, I don't think I would have gone into opera. And I met Teresa Stratus at some point and cried when mm -hmm. I met her and she just embraced me and mm -hmm. said, I know, I know how you feel, because I felt that way too when I fell in love with it as well. <laughs> um, yeah. We may have heard when I mentioned four singers at the start, I mentioned Roberta Peters, Teresa Stratus, Danielle Denise, and you. Yeah. Because all of you were teenagers singing opera. Yes. And she was in the late 1950s in these small roles like Poussette and Manon, which are fine roles. But um, Roberta Peters and you were different because you started in big roles right away. Yeah. But we're going to get to that in a moment. What I want to do is, um, if we think about current opera singers, Angela Mead and Nadine are two who stand apart because they win every competition. You don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> but when you were young, um, you won everything, and you were the youngest person ever to win the Metropolitan Opera National Council finals. I was there in 1989 or 90 or, um, no, not 89. You were born in 89. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 2009. 2009. Yeah. Okay. So it was right after or around our cruise. Yeah, yeah. it was. And right after. Yeah, right after. So at 20. Yeah. 
which is just frankly not done. And um, I'm not going to ask you what was it like, but what I do want to ask you is um, the experience of competitions, because there are not many people who can speak to this in this way, um, where there are judges, I've been a judge in competitions, there are many talented young people. Um, sometimes you win. You win a lot more than one, a lot more than other people did. But you didn't always win, correct? No, okay. I didn't always win, no. And talk about the experience of competitions from the inside. Absolutely. Well, again, r um, going back to Marilyn Horn, she was actually the one who encouraged me to do the Met competition in the first place. I was 19 at the time, and I asked her about it. I, you know, I was concerned about my age, and I thought that I was maybe too young. The judges wouldn't really appreciate what I could do because I wasn't maybe as skilled as some of my, my peers who were much older than I. And she said, who cares? Who cares what people <laughs> think? Just do it. That's her kind of motto. It's like, who cares? Just go for it. And if you don't get anything, fine. If you do get something, great. As long as you took the, ex the learning experience with you for the next thing you try to accomplish, which I thought, hmm, that's quite intelligent. OK, fine. So she taught me to go into competitions with no expectations. If you don't have any expectations, you'll never be disappointed. And I was like, this gold, this genius. And that's what I did. And honestly, Fred, I kind of do that with everything else that I try to tackle that I've probably never done before, or it's my debut in a role. I just go into it with no expectations because I, I don't want to put that pressure or that stress on myself. I just let life happen the way it's supposed to and let people give their opinions and I just accept it um, because otherwise, I don't know, I, I, I feel like the, the, the experience would be then negative. Um, and that's what I always tell young singers. I tell them to go into every competition expecting literally nothing, just learning something from it and using that uh, newfound wisdom for the, the next thing they try to yeah, tackle. Because frankly, having been a judge, um, I can tell you that the judges often go in with preconceived notions. And they mentally have picked their winner even before they've heard anyone sing. I'm not saying this is always the case. And it's not just about opera. One time I was a judge on a cake competition in Piemonte. <laughs> And there were 75 cakes, and 72 of them really were not good. Um, one of them was outstanding, and the other two were pretty good. I had to taste all 75 cakes. What I didn't know was the person who was the underwriter of the competition and a local count or whatever he was had told everyone who the winner should be, his girlfriend, and, um, and her cake was just not very good. So I protested you because I said, anything, it happened in Piemonte. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Sorry, it was, it was in, in the Provincia di Alba, I think. <laughs> and, um, and you know, it was all casalinga, which is, means homemade, and that can be very good. But one cake was just outstanding. But the lesson I got from that was, sometimes the deserving person, the clearly deserving person does not win. And so that's why, as Nadine says, you really cannot take it personally. Um, you have sung at competitions in Europe, in America. I have a performance that we're going to play now, A Il Suo Nome from Lodoletta by Mascagni. Who handed you that piece that no one ever <laughs> that was knows my, this opera? I know. That was my vocal coach, Kamal Khan. Yeah. He always has... I don't know, this desire to give me things that nobody else would give me. And many people back then would question my, my repertoire choices and said, you know, a, a lot of them would say, you're, too, you're far too young for this, your voice is too light, you're this, you're that, and always tried to give me a label as to what I was. And he said, no one can ever predict who you're going to be as an artist. So learn those things now before you even know. And when you get to that point, 
then then you can either keep these things in your repertoire or not. And uh, yeah, it was Kamal. So again, we're going to have a performance from the 20-year-old Nadine Sierra oh God. from Helsinki. <laughs> I want you to look at the conductor, whose name is Leif Sagerstam, and we'll talk about him after. So Julian, if you please, number three.
So if Nadine was 20 there, you can hear what I heard in her voice even then. Um, Julian, set up number six. That conductor is named Leif Sagerstam, <laughs> and we're not going to gossip here. I can gossip. You don't have to. Okay. Um, but what did you learn from him, if anything? Oh, my God. I'll tell you after who he is and how I know him. But <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> He was kind of another conductor, like Levine, who made me feel, even though I was so young, he made me feel like I could just be. He didn't try to meddle with me too much mm -hmm. or try to teach me. He just let me do, he let me kind of sing what I knew at that time and cater to my strengths that I did have at such a young age. And it made me less nervous because I never felt like I had to focus on my weaknesses. So I guess therefore working with him, playing up to my strengths somehow, um, helped those things I was weak at become slightly stronger. And that was quite strange because the competition, I think from what I remember, only lasted for like two weeks. Mm. So to learn so much in such a short amount of time, just with a very simple gracious graciousness from a conductor, especially to a really young singer, uh, that's very precious and doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. Yeah, so let me tell you a bit about Leif Sager's Tom, because I never <laughs> thought I'd have the opportunity to do so. Um, I met him in a sauna in Helsinki. Oh, God. <laughs> His own sauna. Oh. Because Leif Sager's Tom is the head of the conducting department at the Sibelius Academy, which is one of the great music schools of the world. And I had gone to work at the Sibelius Academy, and he, eats a lot, and he typically talks to you with food in his mouth, and he speaks at a very fast clip. Despite looking like a character from the Lord of the Rings. Santa. He, Santa. Santa. From the Finland. He, well, Santa's hair is not that long. Well. Hmm. Um, and the beard, and, but he's quite the character. And I remember he said to me, I'm not gonna imitate the food in the mouth, I want you to come over to my house. I've just written a symphony. I want to show it to you. And I was warned to be careful because when he starts taking out his music, to most people, myself included, it's indecipherable. And what he showed me was not his latest, which was something like number 130. He's now up to 180 or 190. It was number 43, which he told me is his best symphony. And we sat in the sauna with me looking at music, with him eating, and saying to me, this is what I And I thought, I don't know what he's talking about. So I said to him, why don't you swallow your food and then tell me. And then he spoke to me in the most indecipherable musical lease. He speaks English, he went to Juilliard. But the musical language was something that I didn't understand, nothing in my training prepared me to understand what he was talking about. <laughs> so I really can't tell you about his 43rd symphony, <laughs> but um, apparently it broke new ground in music for its <laughs> style, for its key signatures, I don't know. And whenever I've worked with him, I really like him, but I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and because he's so ambitious in a good way to do things in a hurry, and we were talking about, you know, just go do it. I was once in Helsinki when he conducted in Finlandia Hall all nine symphonies of Beethoven in a row. Oh, geez. And he would go off between symphony, get out of one black T-shirt, put on another black T-shirt, <laughs> eat, get back on, conduct. And the audience sat there, and I sat there for hours and hours. <laughs> and this man kept conducting, kept playing, and he was not young then. And, you know, I said to him after the show, are you going to rest now? No, I have to go write a symphony. So he would write a symphony. And the reason I asked you what did you learn is because 
he's a wonderful conductor. He teaches the great Finnish conductors, not only Susanna Melki, Esopekka Salonen, um, all of them. He's the one. But um, he he's just on a different musical planet from most of us. <laughs> and so when I, I him. yeah, I like I like him. Do I like him? I like him because he's so admirable and productive and, and he consumes and he brings out and, and, and but it's not it's not like you can have a con I couldn't have a conversation with him about anything mm. rational because no not because of my failing and not his failing but just because his mind is so full of music and ideas um, so that he can simultaneously prepare nine symphonies of Beethoven write a symphony of his own, and study de Rosenkavalier to conduct next week in Munich, which is what he was doing at the time. Mm. So, um, and this is, I'm really not joking here, could you see his face oh, and yeah. work? Okay, because... Absolutely. Okay, good. He, you know, with me, he was, I don't know, he was very, c at least I found him to be, be very clear. And Flamen Perdona Me, I mean, he never... I don't think he ever even heard it in his yeah. life. And he um, he actually kind of learned the aria as we worked on it together. I, I think I may have even introduced it to him. And he just, I don't know, he showed me such gentleness. And he also, from what I remember, he told me not to go into this as a competition. Mm -hmm. He said, just perform, just enjoy yourself. And actually, I didn't win. This was one of the mm -hmm. competitions I did not win. That's why I played it. I won second. Yeah. I won second place, and he did something very strange that I had never seen a conductor do ever or anybody. He was backstage with all of the singers, and he made it very obvious who he thought should have won. And I was so uncomfortable. <laughs> But at the same time, I was like, yes, this guy has balls. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I, I loved that because I had kind of been taught, um, yeah, at this like little age of 20 that you're not really allowed to express how you really feel in this industry. And he just didn't care. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be alarming, but at the same time, Really cool, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if it's any consolation to you, uh, I had a friend, she's, unfortunately she's died, but she won Miss Italy in 1946. She was wow. Miss Italy. Sophia Loren came in second <laughs> to my friend Anna. Wow. So Anna was a beautiful woman. She was not Sophia Loren. So it happens. Yes. It just happens. It so that's why you properly understood at a very tender age that it's not about you. No. And it's about learning. And I'm saying this because we have music students here tonight and there are many others watching. And I want you to understand that, that this is about making art, about having fun, about sharing things. And winning is very arbitrary. I can tell you as someone who's been nominated many times for the James Beard Award, never won, <laughs> that yes, it's nice to be nominated and be a finalist. but. Um, it's nice to win, but if you don't, you still have a wonderful experience. Now, another thing you won, but you, this was not a competition, this was a prize, was the Richard Tucker grant, yeah. Richard Tucker Foundation grant. Mm -hmm. And I was there, and as I said to Nadine upstairs, I've seen all, I'm a Nadine Sierra completist, all of her <laughs> roles except for Nanette and Falstaff in Berlin last year, and I was in Berlin. Mm but I couldn't get a ticket. So I didn't see it. I'm gonna to have to see it another time whenever you next do it. But um, I don't recall if what I'm about to play is the year that you were the recipient. It was 2016? Ah, uh, no. Okay. Um, but you still, had you won it already? No. No. I won it in 2017? 17, yeah, I thought so, so too. Yeah, so the year after. So even though she hadn't won yet, already they had her on the stage with big stars, and um, it's just terrific. That is oh. Ipuritani. Enjoy it. Just listen to the beauty and the joy of the singing. Oh, <laughs> 
Julian, next set up number eight, please. Um, I realized as I sat there that tonight's subject is the education of Nadine Sierra, but through that, the education of all of us. And so rather than talk about that, yes, you were great, and Javier Camarena was and is great, um, the technicalities of what was going on in that he was holding your hand most of the time. Yes. He was looking at you most of the time. Um, you had probably not sung this music with him before. No, never. You've never sung the role of El Elvira and Puritani. Never. Okay, so it's all new. It's great music. Those of us who are older heard Joan Suttle and Luciano Pavarotti sing this all the time. And then Alfredo Kraus was Suttle and with Cavalier. And so we have memories. And but you don't have to live with those memories. You have to make this fresh and real for the audience in front of you that night, as you did. <coughs> but um, he was looking at you a lot. And he was holding on to your hand all the time. And there were things communicated through the hands. What is that about? And what are you communicating <laughs> in front of three? No, really, in front of 3,000 people, you need a certain kind of code between you. What is going on? Totally. OK, so some background about these kinds of concerts. We usually only get one to maybe two rehearsals together with the other singers, maestro, and the orchestra. So with that said, um, singing a duet that I've never sang in the context of the opera, and with Javier, who has done I Puritani many mm -hmm. times in his career, I was slightly nervous. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he, he knew that. So Javier was supporting me. Um, 
it was really just that, mm -hmm. that I'm here with you. If you mess up, I'll be there for you. Um, and I had memorized that duet, God, I don't know, maybe in two days, mm -hmm. something like that. Because also, you know, the repertoire is given us to us sometimes kind of late um, in the process of organizing the whole concert because a lot of the time singers also cancel. Mm -hmm. um, so Barry Tucker, the, the, the son of Richard Tucker, usually has to <laughs> rearrange things when that happens. And um, yeah, Javier was just there to support me should I need his help um, because it was live. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm, I am pretty sure that this was the first time the Richard Tucker uh, Foundation Gala was streamed with mm -hmm. um, Medici in Carnegie Hall. So the pressure of that also made me even more nervous. Um, and I just didn't want to make any mistakes that I knew would be very, you know, apparent. So but what was yeah. he telling you with the hands? Just, <laughs> just that everything was fine, mm -hmm. keep going, and also with high notes, like, okay, cut off, cut off. <laughs> <laughs> I have that a lot with tenors, because I have a lot of tenors that I know, they have very good breath control, but I have really good breath control too. And <laughs> if they want to hold certain high notes, well, I'll bring it because I will <laughs> hold them too. And um, a lot of tenors, when, when I'm with them, and I'll say that about this Rigoletto that I'm doing now with Vittorio Grigolo, he even like grabs me when, okay, stop, stop the note now because I need to breathe and I will. And that's, that's a way of, of us communicating, okay, this needs a breath now, or um, I need to maybe get through some of these notes rather quickly. Can you move it along too? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. And uh, yeah, that's what Javier was doing. So famous true story from another era. From, you are there, 1961. Uh, Birgit Nielsen and Franco Corelli are singing in Turandot at the Met. And he has high notes for about a day. She had high notes for about six days and could just hold it and hold it. And Corelli liked to moisten his throat and he would keep sponges, wet yeah. sponges, and he would sort of put his hand to his mouth and suck water from a sponge in a moment before singing again with Nielsen and Turandot. And she could be very mischievous. And <laughs> so she was singing and naturally, and he was giving all of he had. But at a certain point, he didn't have it anymore. And they were doing the hand thing. And she kept going. Yeah. And he ran out. So at the kiss, he turned and bit her neck. <laughs> Literally bit her neck. And so she finished the performance, she took the bows, and then the next day she called up Rudolf Bing, who was then general manager, and said, Mr. Bing, I, I regret to tell you that I will not be able to sing the next performance of Turandot. Why? I have rabies from the <laughs> So if Grigolo bites you, <laughs> oh God. you can invoke Birgit Nielsen. <laughs> so probably your most famous role is as Gilda, which you're now singing at the Met through. How many more performances? Uh, I think we have seven left. OK. Yeah. So absolutely see it, whether you like a Las Vegas Rigoletto or not. <laughs> see it, because musically, it's terrific. Roberto Frontali is wonderful. Yes. And it's very moving. I went the other night. And Nadine's Gilda is already the stuff of legend. And you began the role at 23, yes. which is pretty precocious. And um, I want you to, as you listen to her and watch her sing Cato Nome, think about breath control and support, OK? Oh God. <laughs>
Julian, please set up number nine. Um, talk about breath control. <laughs> and I played that because it's from 2019, it's current. I also could have played you from 2015, I think it yeah. was, but I, I want you to see that in the space of 10 years, because you've seen Nadine at 20 and now at 30, there has been incredible artistic growth. <laughs> and that is so, so very important. Um, many of you probably have not heard of a singer named Maria Yeritsa. I know you have, Scott, but most people probably don't. Maria Yeritsa was a very famous Tosca a long time ago, and Zalame and other things, in the 1920s. And one of her calling cards was that she sang Visidarte on her back. And Nadine Sierra is the greatest singer on her back since Maria Yeritsa. Oh my God. And, and I've seen them all try it. But I did not see Maria Yeritsa in 1924. <laughs> but I gather that she was outstanding because audiences would go just to see that and wonder how she could do it. And Nadine will actually explain it all for you in this video I'm about to show you. So number nine, Julian. So some of you have been asking me about breathing techniques, exercises for support. Um, I do have one, one big one that I did when I was really young. I started training when I was six years old. And my teacher at the time, she did something really cute with me. And I, I did this for many years, which I think really benefited my kind of ability to sustain long phrases and kind of to sing in any position. And I, I literally mean that, like physically, any position, um, and still have the breath support in order to do that. So she would have me lie on my back, totally lie on my back on the floor, with my kind of feeling my ribs the back of my rib, rib cage, and sort of the lower back side of the diaphragm onto the floor. And she would have me inhale and kind of push myself with my muscles and with breathing in that, that sort of inhale of breath, pushing myself against the floor, right? So that my body would sort of come up and then doing a very long as long as I could, sustained exhale of until you're out. And I would do that for a good minute, I'd say. And we did this before I would start like doing vocal exercises. And I did this for years and I still do this today what does it build it builds an inner so we have a lot of muscles in our bodies right and the muscles that are nearest to the bones these little tiny muscles um, those are probably the most important for a singer the big ones of course are very important as well but the small muscles in our bodies can really help support uh, how we want to produce sound and sort of have the stamina in order to produce a certain kind of sound for a while. Um, so to build those muscles from the inside out, from deep within, is really helpful. And that's kind of the way I did that at such a young age. And also, physical exercise is so important. Physical exercise is going to build those muscles and build your ability to sustain certain kinds of phrases because you've been working on your heart rate going up, your lungs trying to expand and, and take in air as you exercise. It, it, all of those things can really help with singing and my number one um, exercise that I did as a kid was swimming since I'm from Florida. I was swimming all the time every single day and I I kind of did this involuntarily not really knowing that what I was doing was really uh, helping my ability to sing. 
And as an adult now, I still exercise. I try to exercise every single day so that I can still keep up and maintain that stamina for breathing. I even sometimes, like, I've done exercises even on the treadmill or the Stairmaster, um, or even just walking upstairs or walking up a hill, still trying to be able to sing, even though I'm out of breath. How long can I actually sing for whilst doing something that is actively making my heart rate go up? Um, we're athletes in a sense, we're vocal athletes, but you can uh, physicalize your athleticism through exercise in a way that's going to help support anything you want to do vocally. So I would say two things. If you want to do that breathing exercise, just going on the floor, expanding your lungs, your diaphragm, the lower part of your diaphragm, also here too, the, your belly, and breathing out on a, it's just like a hissing sound, an S. And doing it again. Like that. Um, I would say for a minute, try to do this every day and do some physical exercise. I promise you it will make singing a lot easier. P.S. with the breathing exercise, um, the one that's on the floor and the hissing and all that. So when you do breathe in and you're pushing your, not pushing, because I don't want you to force anything, right? It's just sort of natural that your body does this. Your muscles kind of expand outward, right? And you can feel the support of the ground, let's say that. Um, so gravity is sort of pulling you toward the ground. When you hiss out, what happens is, what I feel, is that the very, I was talking about little muscles, the little muscles in the, in the diaphragm, especially in the, in the front, the abdominal wall, they sort of tense a bit and they, they pull inward. So as I'm exhaling, this pulls inward, but keeping your chest cavity open, not deflating uh, inward. So kind of there's nothing really happening here. It's all here. Kind of the circumference of your um, your, your waist, let's say. Yeah. And this pulling in. But it's doing it naturally. Don't force anything. Um, there's no right or wrong way for a certain individual. Some people will pull in more, some people will pull in less. Whatever your body does or how your body reacts naturally is correct. Um, so try something like that and see if uh, your body can sort of build up its own inner strength with that kind of exercise. Julian, set up number 13, please. Is there anything to add to that beautiful explanation? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I did some of those videos because I have a beautiful following through my Instagram account. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I I love, I, I, I'm not sure if I w would become a teacher someday, but I would love something like that because I love young singers probably because I'm still a young singer and I'm still learning and I have no problems admitting that um, and I love the idea of learning I I can't get enough let's say I'm kind of insatiable in that sense and I know that young singers especially young aspiring singers for this industry feel the same way and want to learn as much as humanly possible and if I can pass on the torch like Marilyn Horn did for me or Renee Fleming did for me or Thomas Hampson did for me then I want to do that I would love to have that responsibility um, 
yeah, I, I think sharing is caring. So I try to give as much information as I, as I can to young singers. So what I would add to that is I also have these kind of images in my head of how to sustain <coughs> long phrases or, or long notes. Um, and it actually comes from a tenor and it comes from um, Corelli. And apparently he used to envision breathing in through his eyes. Mm -hmm. If he felt like he was running out of air, he would, I don't know, just, it's like mind over matter, right? And sort of take in oxygen through his eyes. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, it, there's something about that that really clicked with my brain and that's what I do too sometimes I kind of open my eyes a little bit more and I imagine I'm <laughs> taking in that last bit of oxygen and then it's brilliant and somehow it works and I'm like yes <laughs> so yeah did that too look at oh, her really? eyes yeah it's the same thing yeah <laughs> she did really There's, I, wa I yeah. watched her this close uh -huh. a lot and she said this is how I breathe <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, sometimes we have to convince ourselves that we can be superhuman, even though we're not. Um, yeah, so, yeah, just mind over matter. So, yeah, sometimes I do that as well. Yeah. Well, I have asthma, which precluded my ever oh, becoming a singer. <laughs> and because I studied singing, but yeah. I knew that I would have to use that for other purposes because I knew, unfortunately, I didn't have the breath. And, but after watching that video, I got down on my floor. <laughs> Are you serious? And pressed oh, I love into you. the floor and hissing and hissing and coughing and coughing. <laughs> and, but it, I felt the opening, I yeah. will say that. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like my lungs were struggling to open up and it helped. Oh, I'm so it, it glad. Really it really helped. It was my Nadine, ther my Nadine Sierra asthma therapy. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, the video I'm going to play now, some of you have seen before, if you were here the night that Nicola Luizotti was here. Um, it is viral on the internet. Everyone in opera has seen this video. Um, it's Nadine's debut at La Scala. And, uh, you know, you've sung in the Met, Paris, San Francisco, Berlin, La Fenice, Palermo, great theaters, all of them. But there is something about singing Rigoletto or Gilda at La Scala with Leonucci, who is, I studied God. the role with him, and, and he's a genius Rigoletto and a veteran artist and so on. And um, what he does when he's with young artists is, because he was about 73 or 74 yeah. when he did this mm -hmm. with you, um, he passes on the tradition. I've seen it happen on the stage. I'm sure it happens in rehearsal. But he's such a knowledgeable veteran and so generous and so caring about the art form that he hands it to artists. And although he is this beloved star in Italy and should have been used a lot more here than he has been, um, he it's always about who he's singing with. So. At the Met, unfortunately, they no longer have curtain calls after every act. If some of you may remember that it was a thrill, while the, the curtain would come down, they'd be changing the scenery already, and the artists get to come out and get ovations for what they've just done. Now, we wait till the end, people knock you over to get it out of the theater to get mm -hmm. to their cars and subway, and they don't get the applause they deserve. And that bothers me no end. In Milan, you get applause or booing occasionally after every <laughs> oh, act. No. Not you, but <laughs> I've heard it with other great artists. Yeah. And um, it happens. It does. But the thing is, when the Milanese audience likes someone, they really like someone. So Julian, if you would, number 13. <laughs>
<laughs> and last election, uh, Julia, number 14. So, um, <laughs> Grigola worked so hard for that, didn't he? <laughs> I know. Um, yeah. The thing is, this is the perfect example of why we need curtain calls after every yeah, act cool. in opera. Because mm -hmm. it's a thrill for the singers, it's a thrill for the audience. It's a way for us to communicate to them. It's not that every time they're going to repeat what they just sang for you. What were you and Nucci talking about? Oh <laughs> what are you doing for dinner? I have a <laughs> car. <laughs> no, 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 no. He was asking me if I was willing to do it again. Because, yeah, this was my debut. I was the only foreigner in the production. Everybody else was Italian. And I... You know, in the beginning, in the first act, I was quite nervous, of course, because, you know, you also hear about the La Scala audience. They have this tendency, if they don't like someone, they'll boo you off the stage. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to get booed off the stage. <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, you know, to be quite honest, up until that point, the audience had been very cold, not because they wanted to be or that they disliked it. They were testing us. They were testing our nerves, probably especially mine, um, to see how we would react. Mm -hmm. And the way they did that was they, oh, they have this ability to be so quiet. You almost feel like no one's there, but you, you feel that energy of everyone being there and listening, really, really listening in. So up until that point, the audience had been relatively you know, pulling We're back. Holding, and yeah. then finally, it was like the floodgates had just opened. And I really wasn't sure what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't even know it was possible to do a beast in that moment. So when he was asking me, I, I was kind of like, what? Okay, if you want to, sure, it's up to you. You're Leonucci, you're a legend. I'm a nobody. Mm -hmm. So, so when it seemed like it was okay, and Pereira, who is um, the general manager of La Scala, he was actually on the side in his box and he was giving us the go ahead yeah. because Toscanini had in the past banned uh, pieces or encores for Verdi opera. Um, so we kind of needed this okay to break the tradition. It hadn't mm -hmm. been the first time, I think it was maybe the third. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we did it and I, I wasn't quite sure what we had done. I just thought, oh, this is fun. We're doing it again. And then when I got off the stage, my manager explained to me, he said, do you know what you were just part of? I said, no. <laughs> he said, you just kind of made a little bit of La Scala history because you're technically not really allowed to um, be in a, in a Verdi opera. And I thought, Okay, that's mm -hmm. that's cool. Hope it happens again, and it did. It <laughs> happened every yeah, single yeah. night. Every night we did the beast, and I agree with you, Fred, because it really, you know, for me being as young as I was then, I felt like I was in a completely different time of opera. I felt mm -hmm. like I had been transported in time, which is something I, I feel really sorry for my generation. Um, because I know that we won't get many experiences like that. That will be very rare. And this one for me will, yeah, be an experience I'll never forget because of that. I felt like I was just, I don't know, I feel like maybe Verdi was even sitting right yeah. there. You know what I mean? Um, as corny as that sounds, but yeah, it was well, he just lived down the street. He did. Yeah, he, yeah did. he did. He lived two blocks away. So yeah. he, he and the Via Verdi is just to the left of the theater. Yeah, Via that's in right. Front. Exactly. So, um, what did you learn as an artist from Leonucci? Oh my God. <laughs> um, I learned. <sighs> I learned to take risks, even when you're really scared to take those risks and you feel like you're going to be wrong, to just do them and see what the outcome is going to be. So kind of trust your instincts. Um, because if you do trust your instincts and you, and you do those risks, they'll be calculated. And calculated risks are always OK, especially when it comes to building and showcasing a character. 
um, he's very much about that, as you see. Mm -hmm. I mean, he falls to his knees. And for me, I was crying during that and trying to like hold back tears because I thought, you have to sing any flat again. Stop. <laughs> Stop crying. Stop choking up, you know? And um, to have that freedom of not feeling like I had to contain myself emotionally also somehow frees the voice. So you, you kind of can do anything. And he taught me to do that and not kind of not to care. It's almost like the same with Marilyn Horn, just have no expectations and see what the outcome is at the end. Um, and I guess our outcome was, was pretty right. good. <laughs> um, I think you can tell my approach this evening, having known this wonderful artist for a third of her life and watching <laughs> her almost her entire career. I went to a later performance of that. Yeah. But I didn't get to see you backstage, but terrific. And I called it the education of Nadine Sierra because already you can tell what she's learned. My question every time it was been, what did you learn from? Starting with Levine and, and even Leif Sagerstam and all those people. <laughs> and because this, is a, this profession is about growth and knowledge and you unusually young are already passing it on but um, many of the artists you've seen in this series teach, they share. It, so much of what happens is the oral tradition. It's the technically showing how. And um, I want you to understand that Nadine, even if she were only born with all the gifts she has, were it not for the kind of learning that has happened mm -hmm. and her openness to learning, yeah. And your ability to draw from all these people. Um, I, before we came down, suggested to her a role that I think she should do in about 10 years. And I don't know if you'll do it at all, but it's not a role that people think of for you. Yeah. But what I'm not. doing is I'm sort of guessing where her voice will go. I know her acting, her speech, her everything. And there's another role. I'm not telling you what it is. There's another role in the same opera that everyone would naturally say Nadine should do. But I got a lesson about Nadine a number of years ago when I went to San Francisco. You would think that in the marriage of Figaro that she would sing Susanna and you will next season at the Met. Who cast you as the Countess? It was actually David Gockley. David Gockley, yeah. the previous head of the San Francisco mm -hmm. Opera. Mm -hmm. It was a brilliant choice. Thanks. And because... <laughs> The Countess is young at most, she's about 32, but could be younger, but she's often played by women of a certain age. And vocally you were right, dramatically you were right. And um, so therefore, we who care about opera and singers who approach opera need to think of themselves not just by the traditional fach, which means the repertory to which your voice is typically suited, but things that really work for you. So in about 10 years, I know I will see you in the role. Have some water, um, <laughs> if that's a hint. Um, <laughs> and and I, I, I think that you'll be wonderful. And it, it's not in Italian, but we, you know, there is opera in other languages too. Um, <laughs> I want to conclude by thanking you for tonight, uh, by having you sing something with another very fine singer who was supposed to be on the stage a couple of years ago, but the same year you were supposed to come, we had a lot of weather and health yeah. issues that year. So I hope to have him back in the future. But Julia, number 14, if you please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
So the obvious question is, how many hundreds of offers have you had to sing Maria? Oh, <laughs> well, I've I've had some questions about it, and I don't know, was slightly approached. Um, I guess they're doing the Broadway revival, and they mm -hmm. were, you know, questioning. But I don't know. I, I don't know if it would be something I would want to do, or because you know, um, West Side Story by Leonard Bernstein was written as an opera. He wanted it to be um, seen as an opera, not as a musical theater piece. He made that very clear when he wrote it, but <laughs> it has been now tradi traditionally seen as a musical theater or Broadway show. And um, I don't know if maybe an opera company were to take it on, and try to uh, uh, sh see uh, showcase it as an opera as the composer had intended. Um, I think I would probably not question it at all. Mm -hmm. um, but so yeah. Steven Spielberg is making a movie of it now, yeah. and I'm going to send him this video <laughs> um, because she's smart, she's beautiful, she can sing, she can <laughs> act. She has breath control for days. If you want her to lie down on the balcony scene and sing up to the sky while Tony is below, she can do it all, Mr. Spielberg. Aww. So with this, I do want to thank Nadine Sierra a lot. Aww. I feel proud of you, having known you from the, almost the beginning, and love the fact that your future is so bright and that we will have the opportunity, those of us here, but all, all of you watching, whenever I hear people say there are no good opera singers anymore, opera is no longer interesting, yes. that's BS, um, to use a polite term. And when we have artists of this caliber available to us, it, maybe it's our fault that we're not paying attention because the quality is definitely there and it's being passed on to you from the likes of Levine and Nucci and Sagerstam and everyone else, and you are already passing it on to the next generation. So thank you, Nadine Sierra. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thank you.